Blame you. You're making me do it. Well, if you put both of them in, you can hear everything. Yes, you can try it. No, just try it. Three quarters, two, one.
Yes, Jesus, uh, we just thank you. Uh, we are gathered here, Jesus, and we are getting ready to lift our voices to you and praise you. And Jesus, you are the King of Kings. And so I thank you for this time that you've given us, that you set apart for us to be able to meet here uh, and just be family tonight, Jesus, and just to hear your word. And I pray that um, as you speak through Ken, uh, that, 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 it, that your word takes root in our hearts, Jesus, that we take this message, that we don't just hear it, but we actually apply it to our life. And so, Jesus, we thank you once again. We love you and it's amazing. So I was reading today in, uh, some people say Habakkuk, I like to say Habakkuk, Habakkuk, uh, chapter 3, I'm going to read what I was reading today. Starting in verse 2, I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, help us again as you did in years gone by. And in your anger, remember your mercy. I see God moving across the deserts from Edom. The Holy One coming from Mount Paran. His brilliant splendor fills the heavens, and the earth is filled with his praise. His coming is as brilliant as the sunrise. Rays of light flash from his hands, where his awesome power is hidden. Pestilence marches before him, and plague follows close behind. When he stops, the earth shakes. When he looks, the nations tremble. He shatters the everlasting mountains and levels the eternal hills. He is the eternal one. I see the people of Kushan in distress and the nation of Midian trembling in terror. Was it in anger, Lord, that you struck the rivers and parted the sea? Were you displeased with them? No. You were sending your chariots of salvation. You brandished your bow and your quiver of arrows. You split open the earth with flowing rivers. The mountains watched and trembled. Onward swept the raging waters. The mighty deep cried out, lifting its hands in submission. The sun and moon stood still in the sky as your brilliant arrows flew and your glittering spear flashed. Guys, as I sat there reading this, Today, thinking about who Jesus is, thinking about things that we look at down here, like the mountains and stuff that he's talking about, and they seem so eternal, and they seem so everlasting, and yet in the presence of Jesus, they crumble, because he's the eternal one. The power that comes from the throne, and we get a picture of when he's talking about parting the Red Sea, were you angry at the waters? Is that what happened? No. You were rushing to save your people. And as I just sat there, you know, I started to write. I started to picture that. And I was just telling Jesus, I was like, man, Jesus, I want to be so close to you. I want to feel the mist of the waters of the Red Sea on my face as I sit in your presence. I want to feel the dust from that dry land that they got to walk across on when you parted the sea. See, like it wasn't muddy and mucky. It was dry, bone dry, like it had never had water on it before. And it says in here that he created a path that no one knew was there. That's what it says in the Psalms. And nobody knew as they stood there on the edge in terror, thinking that they were about to be destroyed and there was no way out. Jesus knew all along that there was a path through the sea. And see, people couldn't see it until he made a way. 
And that's what Jesus has done on the cross. But I just sat there in the presence of Jesus and I just felt so close to him as I was meditating on this word, thinking about how the Red Sea stood up like walls on both sides of the people as they walked through. And I just, you know, I started to tremble a little bit inside thinking about how awesome that was. And I was telling Jesus, like, as I, as I, as I could feel myself just getting closer and closer to the throne, I started to have that same trouble because I knew I was close to the one who has everlasting power, who's, who's worthy of all praise, the glorious eternal one who was there before anything existed and by his very word spoke and created everything we can see and can't see. And I'm telling you guys, I was just, and I was in it. <laughs> like I was in it. And I was sitting here in my office at the jail and I was just so close to Jesus as I read this and thought about that. And I could actually, at one point with my eyes closed, I felt like I could just feel the mist of that water and stuff as Jesus parted it. Like, that's who we're singing to. That's who we're worshiping. That's who we're giving praise to, the one who's worthy of all praise and all glory and all honor and all power. The one who when you stood there or sat there or laid there, wherever you were, helpless, and you couldn't see a way, Jesus parted an impossible sea and showed you a way that he had put there since before he created the foundations of the earth before you were even a thought to somebody human. And he made a way for us to be here tonight and worship him. So that's who we're singing to, guys.
see in Acts time and time again is the church coming together and crying out for more of Jesus. Um, and he answers that prayer. And there's this filling of the Holy Spirit that happens. And I just think too often, guys, that we get together like this, I don't know that we even come in expecting that that could happen. I think it's a thing that's just in this book, or it's a thing that was just for that time, or it's for now. It's for now. But we're in the last days now, and it's the first thing that Peter gets up and says after the Holy Spirit's poured out on him. He goes, this is, he says he'll pour it out on all his people to be his witnesses, to be transformed into his image. And so, let's pray. Oh, Jesus, as I thought about the verses I was reading before we worshiped you in song, there's so many things that we look at down here in this world, on this earth, that we look at and we feel like, I think we approach them like they're eternal. We expect to get so much from the things and the people on this earth. And yet you're the eternal one. You're the one who has no limit. You're limitless. And shame on us, Jesus, that Sometimes we get together like this and we don't have this expectation that the creator of the universe who speaks and creates isn't going to show up and do something supernatural. We should expect that, Jesus. You should expect that, hey, we're coming into your presence and we're, 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 we're putting our hearts in your hands and just giving our lives completely to you, Jesus, and singing about how awesome you are and singing your praises and worshiping you and, and reading your words, Jesus, that you gave us and talking about how awesome you are. And we should have this expectation, Jesus, that supernatural change is going to take place. Healing is going to happen. Forgive us, Jesus. Forgive us for, for coming in here and not expecting you to do what you do. Because we're looking at you from a human point of view. I pray that you would lift the spiritual blinders we have on. And speak to us tonight, Jesus. Now your words and your very breath, Jesus, would breathe new life into us. we would humble ourselves here tonight and that we would admit how small we make you and in that Jesus you would you would lift us up with you you would speak to us and strengthen us and encourage us and make us 
mold us into the soldiers in your army that we're supposed to be. We love you, Jesus. So, <clears throat> so I was reading in Second uh, Peter over the weekend and. In verse, chapter 1, verse 3, it says, By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. And we have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory, and excellence. It says that he's given us everything we need for living a godly life. And I'm not going to lie to you guys, like right now, that's where I'm at, standing up here. I, I kind of just have stepped out and stepped up here in faith right now and went, oh, Jesus, you live in me. There's this divine power that lives in me. I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to say tonight or anything, but there's this divine power that lives in me, and you've called me to this place, and I have everything I need to step out here in front of your people and, and, and to let you just speak through me and do what you do. And it can be convicting sometimes when we read a verse like this. You know, this was the first one in Second Peter that kept running through my head. Everything we need for living a godly life by this divine power that Jesus has put in us when we trust him. And so often, so guys, why is it so often that we, we live thinking we need something? I mean, why is it that we don't believe this? Why is it that we're always sitting around thinking we need something else? Feeling like something's missing? You know, uh, and later on in this, this chapter, so I'm just going to read for a little bit more. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share in his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. So not only has he given us everything we need for living this godly life, on top of it he's given us these precious valuable, priceless promises. The promise that it, we're looking at here is the coming of his kingdom. This is what Peter's talking about because you can just start to flip through here and see But in this context what Peter's talking about is Jesus coming back and this, this awesome, you know, I think what does he call it? He calls it this grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he goes, so, like, he's making it so easy on us. And as I started to think about that, that was the next thing that I started to think about. Like, man, we are, you know, we are so quick. And I even do this with my kids. You know, if we're going to do something and, and they want ice cream or they want a toy or something, you know, a lot of times I will listen if you're good. If you're good, we can do that afterwards. Right? And, 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 and so often you see the kids, are, they're just so good. You know, they're like, okay, we've got to hold it together. Because Dad has promised us something. Dad's made a promise to us 
that and believe me, my kids, they'll call me on it. They'll be like, lie. <laughs> if I don't get it for them, you know? Like, they'll tell me, that, Dad, you promise. You can't lie. You know, you'd stand up there and talk about Jesus. So they know, they go, hey, you know, Dad promised us something. And so we're going we're gonna to be really good and we're going to hold it together so that we get this promise. And yet the promise that we're talking about here is so much greater than ice cream or a toy or a paycheck on Friday, you know, or whatever it is that we kind of look to and we go, man, we know we got this coming or, you know, everybody was looking for their stimulus checks. And where's my check at, man? You know, like we have this thing coming and we, we act differently and we start to get on our phones and we're shopping for stuff and we're looking around and we're planning what we're going to do and all because we think we have this thing coming and yet Jesus here is promising us to have a spot in his kingdom, this grand entry into eternal life with him and there's this promise and he goes man I've given you everything you need I'm going to live in you and I'm going to empower you to live this godly life that I've called you to and I'm giving you these precious promises for you to focus on so that you don't get caught up in what's going on down here and the stuff that's happening down here if you just look a little bit past it you just you know look at it in the light of you know eternity with me you'll be able to handle these things so much better you know you'll be able to know what to do with these things you'll be able to know when to walk away you'll be able to you know go no i'm just not going to do it and that's what he goes on to talk about after this you know in view of all this and what i really think about when it's talking about to escape the world's corruption you know there was one time i preached this message here and, you know i had a flashlight up here and I, and I turned off all the lights in here so it was really dark you know, and I was thinking about John 8, uh, John chapter 8, verse 12, where Jesus tells you, he goes, hey, I'm the light of the world. This is the promise. And he goes, and if you follow me, you don't have to walk in darkness anymore. <laughs> you know, and I turned off all the lights, and you guys saw when I did the picture thing how dark it gets in here, right? So it was a little darker than I even thought I was going to get. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm kind of scared. And I turned on my light, not really, but I turned on my light. And all you could see was, you know, just where the flashlight was, right? And, and it was this thing where it was like, that's what it's like to follow Jesus. Like, wherever that light was, I, I could step there and I could see what was happening. And, and, it, and it's this picture of just being surrounded by darkness. And in this dark and evil world that it says we live in, and it's so easy to get caught up in the stuff that's down here. But Jesus goes, no, no, no. If you follow me, you can walk in the light. And you don't have to walk in this. And so he's giving you this precious promise even to keep your eyes on the light. You know, and your, your eyes on eternity and focus everything through that lens. You know, everything that you see happening. And so he says, in view of all this, he goes, look, everything I'm telling you in view of, you know, this divine power that lives in you now. You know, it says that the power of the Holy Spirit lives in you with the power to raise the dead. That lives in you. And he goes, in light of all this, you know, these precious promises that Jesus has given us to enable us to escape the world's corruption, in view of all this, having looked at all that that's happening, he goes, make every effort to respond to God's promises. And I'm not going to lie, like that verse right there, probably for two days straight, I knew that I was kind of heading there tonight at some point when I got here, you know. I probably knew that Monday night, I think, or something like that. It might even been Sunday night. But it was that verse. It just kept playing over and over and over again in my head. Make every effort to respond to God's promises. Make every effort to respond to God's promises Supplement your faith with generous provision of moral excellence, moral excellence with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with patient endurance, and patient endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love for everyone. So he gives this list of things, and if you look at that list for a minute, and if you just glance at that list, you're like, that's impossible. But Jesus goes, I've given you everything you need to live that. And he goes, so make every effort to respond to my promises. 
and, and I, guys, we, we make, I think the reason that that verse kept going over and over and over in my head is, do we really make every effort? Do we really make every effort to respond to, to God's promise? You know, for some reason, I think, I, I don't know. I don't know where it got mixed up or where it got lost, but for some reason, I think that people think like the Christian life is a is just like, like yeah, you have this peace inside and you have this joy inside. You have this fruit of the spirit where you're not stressing out, and you're not worried about things, and you always have joy. But I think that you know, for somewhere along the line, somebody said that it's just like this kick back, laid back thing. And you're just kind of cruising and you're just heading into eternity. And I'm like, well, Jesus didn't say that. So it makes you wonder where that comes from. And people even look at Matthew 11 and they go, well, Jesus said, come to me all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, right? And, and, and give them to me and I'll give you rest for your soul. Rest for your soul. Why? Because when you do that, there's this precious promise. To keep your eyes on. But he, he says, make every effort to respond to this promise. Make every effort to respond to this promise. And guys, so listen, and down here a little bit later in verse 10, it says, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Guys, we... We work so hard at so many other things. We will grind so hard at so many other things. But we don't work that way a lot of times for Jesus. And look, let me just be clear about this in the beginning. I'm not saying that you're earning your salvation. Salvation, obviously, is a free gift from Jesus. And he's going to, because you got this free gift, and now there's this promise, this, your response should be hard work. Should be hard work. I mean, even Jesus goes, my burden is light. He didn't say there wasn't a burden. He just goes, hey, you know what? My burden is light. You know why? Because your hard work for me is nothing compared to trying to carry the weight of your sin. Because you can't do it. That will crush you. That will crush you. But guys, are we making every effort, really, to respond to these promises? Are we working hard to prove that we do belong to Jesus, that he's called us and chosen us. And not to prove it in a, you know, and this is why I prayed before we started that Jesus would give us spiritual eyes tonight because not to prove it in a way like, I've got to prove myself to Jesus, I've got to prove myself to people, but man, that, that, that there'd be proof that we belong to Jesus, that people would know when they look and go, man, look at him, he's pouring his life out. Look at her. She's just pouring her life out for Jesus. Every effort is put forward as she works so hard or he works so hard because of what Jesus has done and working for Jesus. And here's the thing, guys, because you know what I've seen over the years since we've been here? Uh, a lot of people fall away. I see the very next thing he says. So the reason that you work hard is because if you work hard at doing these things and you grow in this way with this moral excellence and this self-control and this perseverance and this knowledge, like really knowing and understanding God and you know having this holiness in your life and this love for everyone and this brotherly and sisterly love. He goes, if you grow in this way, because you won't fall away. He goes, if you work hard at this, and you work hard for Jesus, he goes, you won't fall away. Let's just be honest, guys. Like, if we were sitting here right now, and everybody in here, you know, we were all like, we're going to get hot. And, like, we called some people, and we couldn't hook. 
We couldn't hook up. None of us would stop there. We stay here four days, right? This would be the control center of our operation. There's just, I never set out to go get high and came home and went, this is just not happening. <laughs> never. I worked hard. <laughs> I worked hard. And yet, here we are, and Jesus has given us a new life and given us everything we need to live this godly life, and we're just kind of like, And if you look at the people in this book, man, that were close to Jesus, they worked hard. Moses fought up and down that mountain, dude, like eight times. Just to be in the presence of God. He just wanted to be close to Jesus. And he worked hard. He was not young. He was the first free solo, right? He was the first rock climber. He was up and down that thing. He worked hard, man, just to hear from Jesus, to have a message to give to his people. And that's, you know, I even tell you, even when I was talking about this verse today, I even felt that way today. I'm like, I'm working so hard, Jesus, to hear what you, you want me to say to your people. You know, he just honors that. And, 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 and just to be in your presence, Jesus, and just to be close to you. Uh, and sometimes it's just, it should be convicting that you work hard at so many other things. You know, everybody knows about Noah. I think it took him about 120 years to build that boat. It was not easy. It was hard work. He even talks about it in 2 Peter. He even talks about Noah in chapter 2 when he's talking about false, pe false teachers and, you know, People that disobeyed and sinned. And he goes, you know, in, in verse 5, and, and, and God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected him. See, it was in Noah's work that he experienced closeness with God. It was in Moses' hard work climbing up and down the mountain that he experienced closeness with God. You know, sometimes we have this opportunity. I know, and I love it sometimes. I've been sitting alone in my office, or I get to go to the cottage. I try to do that once a month. There's nothing wrong with that time. But, like, I get so close to Jesus, and I'll experience him in such a thick, heavy way. Like, he's sitting next to me, and we're just talking. And I'm just like laying my head on him, like that's how close I am with him. And the time is up, and I don't want to leave. No offense, but I'm like, I don't care if I ever see any all again at that moment, right? I don't even mean that mean. I'm just like, I don't want to go, Jesus. And, and every time, he's just like, well, I'm not staying here. I'm leaving, and I'm gonna work hard, Ken, to seek and save lost people. Are you coming? I'm like, well, I'm not going to sit here with me. I want to be with me. You know? I want to be with you, Jesus. Jesus worked hard. I mean, Jesus walked up to the well, and he sent the guys to get him food because he was hungry. There was times Jesus and his disciples didn't go days. They went days without eating. People started to call him crazy and demon-possessed and all kinds of other stuff. Because they worked so hard for God. It's all they cared about. Uh, he was thirsty. And tired and sat on the well. Jesus worked hard. From the minute he was baptized. right From the minute he hit the earth. But from the minute he was baptized. He set out to the cross. And he worked hard to get there. He worked hard to get to the cross. Like Nobody was going to stop him. People tried, they said stuff, they, 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 you know, they tried to get him off his mission. But he worked hard, and it's easy for us to go, yeah, well, he was God. He was also fully man, and he felt all the same things we do. And you go, well, yeah, but that was his mission. Well, Jesus said, pick up your cross and come on. He said, pick up your cross and follow me. If anybody doesn't deny himself, doesn't deny the stuff he wants to work hard at 
and pick up his cross and follow me? He says, you're not worthy to be mine. I don't know about you guys, but the picture I get with carrying a cross doesn't seem easy. It's hard work. We would work hard. We would make every effort. Because look at what happens. He goes, if you're not doing this, he goes, if you're doing these things, you won't fall away. But if you're not doing this thing, in verse 8, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. Listen, he's not saying, hey, they just can't see. That's not what he's saying right here. He's saying short-sighted or blind. The picture that he's giving right here is when people that aren't working hard, people that aren't making every effort to respond to the promise, the reason they fall away is because they're short-sighted. He's saying, you ever, you ever like had to squint to look at something? That's the picture he's giving. He's going, they're closing their eyes deliberately. They know. They know they should be working hard. But he goes, no, no, no. They, they squint to almost block it out. So they can kind of just focus on what they want to focus on or act like they don't see it. Or act like they don't know. Listen, getting alone with Jesus is awesome. You should be doing that. You should be working hard to do that. How many of us work hard to do that? Guys, i got to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning sometimes to spend time with Jesus in here so I have something to say. Like, I know a lot of people just think pastors just like, well, he works 45 minutes a week, twice a week. You know, like, it's like, i got to get up at 4 in the morning sometimes to make sure I have time to just sit in the presence of Jesus, to hear from him, to know that, like, you know, I gotta climb the mountain. Do we work hard to climb the mountain or is it like, and I'm not condemning anybody who sleeps in occasionally. It's like, you know what I'm talking about. It's just this thing where you'll fit it in. And you guys in the house and stuff like that, man, like, it, it, it's set for you right now. There's a structure for you. And so it's all there. And what we're hoping is that that carries on, you know, or the transformation happens, but that you don't, you know, do you work hard or are you just doing the minimum? You know, in Romans it says nobody's truly seeking God. It should all turn away and Oh, there's nobody good. And there's nobody's truly seeking after God. I mean, here's the awesome thing. When we go back, think about Jesus' love for you. How hard he worked to go to the cross. For your sin. For your wrong. And he calls us to do the same thing. See, some of us, we just want to work hard if it's for us. If there's something in it for us, I can work hard, right? Like, how am I working hard if there's something in it? You know, I remember when, uh, when Jack was just real little. Uh, I, I think he was in kindergarten. And I was in Strongsville because, you know, that was halfway between where his mom that I was separated from lived. And I had custody of him. And, and Strongsville's not cheap. You know, it was in a cheap city to live in. And I worked construction. And, and not even good construction. I work, you know, construction, $300 a week is what I brought home. And I work close to 50-some hours a week, you know, doing waterproofing. And I would drive in a hoopty car that I had. I would drive all the way to Macedonia, you know, 45 minutes to an hour almost every morning in traffic and every afternoon back. And, and we would eat butter noodles. We lived on that. It's funny because Delilah always has me make her butter, butter noodles and she thinks I'm like the, the butter noodle king. She's like, nobody makes them like you, Dad. I'm like, we used to live on them. You know, like, and, I, and it doesn't take much talent to do that. So I'm not like putting myself up, but I'm just going, you know, that's what we used to, to live on. And, and, and I worked hard. You know, I had this awesome work ethic. 
So me and him could have an apartment, and have a car, pay for gas, and do whatever this world tells you to do. And then, you know, and I just wonder, do we work that hard for the king? And really what it's saying here is he's talking about people falling away. You know, because in, in 2 Corinthians 5, the same thing is in view here, where he's talking about our new bodies, and he's going, man, we're going to have new bodies. You know, that these earthly bodies, they're dying, and so I get it. I get it. These earthly bodies we're in, they get tired, and they get worn out. But my soul has rest, so so what? These guys understood. Paul understood. There was work to be done. And he says, you know, you know, like we're in these bodies, and as long as we're in these bodies, we're not at home with the Lord. So in verse 6 he says, but we're always confident. That even though we, you know, that as long as we live in these bodies, we're not at home with the Lord. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident, and we would rather be away from these early, earthly bodies, for then we will be at home with the Lord. Listen to what it says next. So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please Him. See, I, I thought about it before I started to talk tonight, and I think the struggle that I had all day trying to hear clearly, it wasn't that I couldn't hear clearly, I just, I don't know that I wanted to say some of this stuff that I'm saying right now, because, you know, it's easy to get in this church world and this, you know, supposedly Christian, I mean, people are shooting people in the streets and they're starting Facebook pages going, Hey, this guy's a God-fearing Christian. And I'm just going, oh my gosh. This, this is our world, right? Christianity. It's just everybody's a Christian in America, man. Even though nobody's working hard to, to, to serve the king. And, and so it's this thing where it's like, oh, Jesus, can I say that we should please God? Or we should work to please God? And he's going, I said it. I said it. But the minute you say something like that, they're like, oh, you're realistic. You know, you're talking about works. And it's just somebody's lame-ass excuse to lay back and not do anything. There it is, right? It's just true. It's just like, oh, so we can just coast into eternity. Let me tell you what Jesus says about that in Matthew 7. He goes, look, the gate is narrow, and the road is difficult, and very few find it. It's a difficult road. You're not going to coast in. You're not going to go do whatever you want to do, die in your sin, and be flying high. That's just not happening. That's just not happening. Jesus himself, the Holy Spirit, saying to us, man, hey, we're, whatever we do, we should be working hard to please God. And, and listen to what he says next. Why? Because we all must stand before Christ and be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. People have a lot of different interpretations on that. I'm just going to go with what it says. I'm just going to go, it sounds pretty serious. I'm not going to interpret it away to make everybody feel better tonight so they can go home and live in their sin. He goes, if you're not working hard, if you're not working hard to seek my face, if you're not working hard to please me and chase after lost and broken people, Jesus goes, you're not working with me. And you'll fall away. Or you'll, you know, we all must stand before Christ. I'll never forget, we were at a banquet one time. There's a lot of people there. And there's a guy, I really like this guy, but, you know, I, I've never really talked Jesus with him. I know he said he was a believer, and he's on the stage. And, and it's this banquet, and he's given this sermon illustration, and it's actually a really good sermon illustration. And then it just takes a quick turn. And he goes, well, come on, guys. We're believers, so we're not going to get judged. 
And I forget who was sitting with me. It might have been my own wife. And she goes, that's not true, right? And I go, that's not true. That's not true. Gosh, you gotta, you got to really read this thing and go, well, this is what it says. This is what it says. He goes, man, we're all going to sit there and be judged. And so listen to what he says, the very next thing that Paul says. Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. Guys, I'm telling you, this just lit a new fire in me today. I just went in, and I just went into the jail, and I just was like, I just going up on cell blocks and going, anybody want to read? And I'm just sitting down, and I'm just dropping gospel on people and bringing back the gospel. And, and I could tell, like, a lot of them just didn't want to hear it, and I don't care. I just don't care. And, that, and we just got to be that way, all of us. That, like, and, I, and I think that's the problem. I had a little bit of problem I had before today with this. It's just like, work hard. It's just not a popular... It's not a popular thing to say. They'll, they'll look to John 6 and they'll go, well, it says human effort accomplishes nothing. He's talking in the context of salvation and eternal life. Yeah, your human effort isn't going to make you live forever. Your human effort isn't going to save yourself. You're not perfect. You can't be the spotless lamb. The sacrifice who came to take away the sins of the world. That's what he's talking about there everywhere else. I mean, you ever hear Jesus, what he says in Matthew 25? Matthew 25, Jesus is talking about the end times and stuff. And he goes into Matthew 25 and he says this. You know, he has this parable of these three servants. He goes, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. In Luke 19, it's the same kind of parable. It's about the same stuff. There's just more servants, but there's still three he gives the money to. But he says something different in Luke 19. He goes, you know, the guy went away to be crowned king. And he said, you know, when he went, a bunch of the people said, no, I don't want him to be my king. See, that's a little more accurate. See, the reason you're not working hard for the king is because he's not your king. Because if he's your king, that's what it looks like. Whatever you want, king. You're my king. And so that's really what's going on here is he's going, you know, they decided they didn't want me to be their king. And so there's this parable, and he goes, you know, he entrusted his money to him while he was gone. See, he gave them everything they needed to live a godly life. He gave them everything they needed to invest and work hard for the kingdom. He gave them everything they needed. Five bags to one, two bags to another, one bag to another guy. And you, you hear this and he goes... The first one, he invested the five bags, he made five more. The, you know, the second one, he invested the two bags, he made two more. And the third one, he, he just buried it. He didn't even go off and, and spend it and not have it. He just buried it. He just didn't do anything with it. And, and so the king comes back and he goes, what happened? And, you know, the guy with five goes, man, I made five more. And he's Celebrate with me. You get this picture of this celebration and this great joy. And he goes, you've been faithful in handling a small amount. Uh, I'm going to give you more responsibility and let's celebrate together. I know some of you guys sitting here tonight think it was like Uncle Ben on Spider-Man who said, with great response, great power comes great responsibility. It was Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was like, I've given you this great power living inside of you. And with it comes great responsibility. And so the next one goes, man, I made two. You gave me two, I made two. And he goes, man, come rejoice with me. You get this picture of rejoicing. I don't even know what that looks like. 
I don't know if that's, you know, that homie magic song where you're like, am I dancing with Jesus right now? Right? I was like, am I dancing with the creator of the universe? Do I get to do that? Do I get to dance with you, Jesus? Because I suck at dancing, but I'll let you lead. Right? And it's just like, and, and, and then the next one goes, here's, here's your, what you left me. I didn't lose it. Here it is. And he goes, you're wicked and you're lazy. I'll never forget the first time I read this. I thought, I remember early on, I thought, that dude's doing a smart thing. <laughs> you know? I just remember coming up the streets going, that's a smart thing. Because you don't want to mess up dude's money. See, I've been in so many situations on the streets where I've messed up some money or dope and been like, man, I've got to go face the music. And I was like, looking at it from a worldly perspective, and I was like, hey, good job. Bury that stuff. Give it back to him. Yeah, but I didn't smoke it. Right? <laughs> but but so like he comes back and he goes, he goes, here, I didn't I didn't lose it here. I, and he goes, you're wicked and you're lazy. And he takes it from him and gives it to the one with five bags. And they go, well, he's already got five bags. And he goes, yeah, but he was faithful. Because he was faithful at the end of the small amount, I'm going to give him more. And he calls him a wicked and a lazy servant. And he starts to make excuses. The servant goes, oh, I knew that you're, you're harsh. And, you know, he had the wrong kind of fear. He had the fear where he hid instead of the real fear when you really know Jesus. And he's your king. And you're like, there's no place I can go that you won't find me. You know, in Psalm 139, he goes, if I go down to the depths of hell, you're there. Some people have a problem going, what's Jesus doing in hell? He created it. Everybody thinks it's like Satan's playground. No, no, no. He created that for Satan and his demons. That's what we find out in Matthew 25. It's not like Satan's down there putting people in a pot, right? Or stuff I used to see in the cartoons. No, Jesus is down there putting people in hell. It's his. That's it's all his. There's nowhere you could go to get away from him. You would never hide because he's your king and you know there's nowhere you could go. It's real fear of the Lord. I have a fearful responsibility to work hard, to be good with this great power that he's given me. And so he starts to make excuses. And just like Peter saying in 2 Peter, there's no excuses. Jesus is going to look at you and go, I've given you everything you need to live a godly life. I've given you everything you need. I made it easy for you. I've given you everything you need to live a godly life. And so this is what happens, right? It takes a quick turn. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's cruising into eternity, right? Just holding on to what you got. I mean, the parable of the rich fool in Luke says that he goes, that guy thought, hey, I got more than enough now. I'll sit back and take it easy. Jesus goes, you're going to die. You're going to die tonight? And who's going to get all your stuff? And you're a fool to have riches here and not have a rich relationship with God. There's just this call, guys, that we need to see because a lot of times I think what's happening is we feel like we're under attack and we feel we're not close with God and it's because you're not working hard. You're not working hard to be in his presence. You're not working hard to seek his face. You're not working hard to be a part of what he's doing. You're not working hard to make disciples. You're working hard at a lot of other stuff. But not that. And so, I mean, and, and that's what happens. Like, you know, at the end of 25 here, after he gives that parable, he goes right into final judgment. 
It says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory with all the angels with Him, then He will sit upon His glorious throne. I just stopped there for a minute today because I just, can you just picture that right now? Can you just picture that? Jesus coming with all His angels and setting up a glorious throne. Well, it's time. And see, like, we have it. Yeah, a lot of us are sitting here right now going, you know, I don't even really think about that much. And Jesus goes, out, yeah, I know. I've given you this precious promise. And you're not thinking about that, and you're not working hard, and that's why you're not escaping the corruption of this world and, and your human desires. But he goes, he's going to set up his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will place the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. And this is where he reveals that he's the king. Because it says the son of man, Jesus, right, will come and sit on his glorious throne. Then it says, then the king will say. He goes right into this after that parable is done. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. This grand entrance into this eternal kingdom. And this was the people that were working hard. He goes, man, you, you clothed the naked man. You fed the hungry. You visited the people in prison. You opened your home to strangers. And let him in. He goes, man, you worked hard. You made every effort to respond to this promise. And the other ones go to the, the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Right? They will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Guys, I work hard. I make every effort. To respond to these promises. Why? Because Jesus said so. That's why. You don't notice, nobody's passed a plate here ever. We're in this for, for souls for eternal stuff. And what's so cool is, you know, what Paul's talking about when he goes, you know, we'll be judged on the good or evil we've done that there's these rewards. It's like you're storing up treasure in heaven. It's like having direct deposit in heaven when you're working hard. I thought about like preaching on the five crowns that are in here and what they're for. It's all about working hard. You know, as Jesus sends out the 72 disciples in Luke chapter 10, as he sends those guys out, he tells them to pray for one thing in the beginning. He says, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. And so he goes, pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest to send workers. To send workers. And then he sends those guys out and he sends them out to work hard. He sends them out and he goes, hey, listen, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. That doesn't sound like an easy job. Because I'm sending you out as prey. He doesn't even allow them to take anything with them. So don't take any money, don't take, you know, don't take a backup pair of crocs, nothing like that. You know, it's like you're just you're gonna work hard and it's gonna be a job you can't do. And so you're gonna have to rely on me so so much. You're going to work so hard, and, and if you don't work hard and rely on me and work hard on even being in my presence and seeking my face and banging on that door to be filled with the Spirit, he goes, you can't even do it. There's going to be a sheep, and there's going to be wolves. 
and that's what I'm sending you to. He puts them in a position and takes all the stuff that they would rely on. He even takes their walking stick. I don't even take their walking stick. I don't want you leaning on anything but me. Work hard, guys. We gotta work hard, you know, and and, and it starts, it's gotta start <clears throat> like now. And it can be one of these things where you sit here right now and you go, you kind of feel overwhelmed and you're like, what do I need to, what do, I need to do? You know, and in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, Jesus says, do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. It doesn't have to be anything huge. Like, but we need to be people that are praying for Jesus to put us in positions that we can't handle. Jesus, give me work I can't handle. That's what our prayer should be. If we really believe Jesus is who he is, we should be, Jesus, whatever, whatever work you get me started on, whether it's small or whatever it is, I want to be a part of something I can't do. Whatever work you have for me, Jesus, I want it to be so big that I can't handle it. So I just got to constantly beg you and plead you, plead with you to show up. And so everybody that sees this work, whatever it is being accomplished, right, will look at me and go, man, Jesus is awesome. I tell you guys, if you're here and really recovered, the work is bigger than what you can handle. Let me tell you. When this whole thing started, I was sitting in the ER, it was before this was even a thing. It was just a name that Jesus had given me. I'm sitting in the ER with somebody, trying to put him into detox, and the nurse comes out and she goes, We Narcan 10 people in the parking lot on a slow day. In the parking lot. That's not even people that come in. Just the people that don't even make it into the door. They're trying to get to the ER and it's done. She was on a slow day. And I remember sitting there and going, man, Jesus, it, it, it was that moment where I go, oh, I can't. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm one man. I'm one man sitting here. I can't. How am I going to do anything? I can't do anything. And Jesus goes, yeah, I know you can. But what's impossible with man is possible with me. And that was the moment, man, that I just really, I, I prayed, Jesus, give me more than I can handle. And you see the fruit of it. It's here. You see it. Look around, man. You see it. Jesus is. And the impact he's had on people that aren't even here, good and bad. They'll never forget. <laughs> They'll never forget. The king touched them. Jesus touched them, man. They can't even let it go, even the, even the haters. <laughs> They're watching right now. <laughs> I'm telling you, they are. They know everything I do and say. It's true. But that's because Jesus touched them, man, and they encountered him, and they're trying to make sense of it and aim something at me, and it's like, no. No. You're swimming. Yeah. <laughs> You're swimming. Let's pray. Let's pray. I'm just going to stop there. Let's pray. <laughs>